What did I misspell? Trial? Trail? Trial? You spelled trail trial. In? But I laughed to myself in the text message that you sent me yesterday. Oh, oh okay. Gotcha. I was like, it was a trial, <laughs> <laughs> but also right. a trail. All right. Wait, no, no, don't, don't waste the good stuff. Welcome to Retraction. I'm your co-host, Antoine. And I'm your co-host, Jamie. And we're reversing course through discourse on the pod. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Retraction Media. And subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and more. It is episode 100. Coming at ya. We made it, people. We made it. We're still doing it. We still like each other. So, uh, so that's something for on-air talent. And uh, yeah, yeah, we got that going for us. And it's I think very, it's because yeah. we probably it's probably because we don't hang out a lot. This is like our thing, right? Oh, I think that's part of the magic, absolutely. Right, uh, touring bands don't generally hang out outside of the tour, right? Well, I think they get stuck on the tour bus. So uh, that because they're always together, I think that that's where the animosity builds. But luckily, we are not. We're apart. We have two separate <laughs> lives, and we we do not have to travel every which way and uh, and do this in person. That's also as George helpful. as George Costanza says, we don't want our worlds colliding. That's right. Never the two shall meet. Otherwise, the uh, universe implodes. And uh, and listeners, this is a very special episode because with us we have a guest. We have a uh, an exciting trailblazing um masquerading the return well it's the it's the, it's the triple return it's the this is the what do you call that it's not a sequel what's the, what's the tri- official term it, it, i mean it could be a trifecta it this could a trilogy, be the, a hat trick a trilogy mm, mm. well this is our trilogy i mean unoffic- unofficially probably uh this is trail mix part three part trois as the french may say uh part tres is that is that how you say it just for those who speak spanish jamie you speak spanish a little bit no right? i don't Okay, well, I made that up. <laughs> Welcome back to the pod, Maxine. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here for the hundredth episode. This is a big deal. A hundred is commitment. You guys have really been doing it. I, I appreciate that recognition. I love that. I love that. That's like the kind of thing you say when something is continues to go, but it's no longer as good as it should be. Like the that's what you would say maybe to Matt Groening of The Simpsons. You're like, wow, you're no, still making I, those episodes. Fantastic. It's like, it's like fair at the end of Ferris Bueller when he's like, you're still here. It's like everyone just expected it to go by now. I mean, in general, podcasts that that last this long, like that's a positive thing. That's not that common, is it? Most people start a podcast. They have the best intentions and then they abandon the podcast. But you have not. Sounds like a good name for a podcast, The Best Intentions. <laughs> I feel like that should have been our. That's actually a better, I think, track for retraction than retraction. Just this is the best intentions. We have the best intentions with everything <laughs> we do. I love it. That should be our tag. We should just put that as a, in our tag. TBI. Now. TBI. Okay. Hashtag. Hash it up. The best intentions. I love it. So, so got to get into it. So, Maxine. You're joining us for the 100th episode, and that's because we wanted you on because you finally returned to us from the wilderness, the great outdoors. Yes. How long were you out there? First of all, did I mention what trail you're on? I might not have. Not yet. You could do it. Okay. Well, yesterday you messaged me asking me which trial I was on. (laughs) And not only was it a trail, but it was indeed a trial. Mm -hmm. Uh, This year I completed the Continental Divide Trail which is part three of the Triple Crown Trail series. So I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, Pacific Crest Trail in 2019, and now I've done the Continental Divide Trail in this year, 2022. And I'm back. I think that's wild. First of all, you've done a Triple Crown, and this is your third time on the pod. So have we been there for every step of the, like every, yeah, every leg of this journey? Wow. You have. I was thinking that exclusive like, this is a trilogy or, or first or first. This is my triple crown of your podcast. <laughs> so thank you. I love so it. you said it was um, it's the Continental Divide Trail, the Appalachian. And what was the second one you went on? Pacific Crest Trail. Pacific Crest Trail. And so what does the Continental Divide Trail cover? So it runs from Mexico to Canada, just like the Pacific Crest Trail. But it goes through New Mexico, Colorado, 
Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. Wow. And how long did that take? It took me 144 days to hike. And I started May 3rd and finished at the Canadian border September 6th. And ultimately, in the fashion of the CDT, which is a very disjointed trail in a lot of ways, I had to go and complete a missing section that was closed due to fires. So ultimately, I finished the trail on September 23rd. So it was like May to September, I was out there hiking northbound. (laughs) Wow. And How does he even cut it? <laughs> That's I, I mean, what do you say that in terms of, so it was 144 days, you said? Yes. How long were the other ones? The others were similar. I have some trail data readily available here. <laughs> uh, the Pacific Crest Trail took me 147 days and it was about the same mileage. And the Appalachian Trail took me 165 days and it was about... 500 miles shorter. So basically this trail was the longest and I hiked it the fastest, which I think makes sense because at this point I have more experience hiking and I knew what to expect, but, um, it was a tough trail. It was, that's interesting because you're (laughs) chalking it up to experience. I was going to say was the terrain easier. I didn't even think about the experience part of it. In some ways, the terrain was, easier in other ways it was harder so it's really hard to to sort of compare there um the so just for ease of reference i will call it the cdt it's just faster more efficient so it is um it's a defined trail but there are some parts that are unclear and that are still being developed so it involves a lot of road walking and i think we touched on this last time too because i was even unsure about exactly what this meant to have like an incomplete, complete trail. There are a lot of forest roads, interstates, uh, gravel roads, dirt roads, just all sorts of like, there's like a trail network, but not all of it is like a walk in the woods, like you might imagine. So sometimes that was flatter and like less, you know, intense But at the same time, I was then having to navigate and kind of go cross country and figure out my way. So sometimes where the trail terrain was easier, it presented different challenges altogether. I think last time you had mentioned that the trail took you through people's yards and they were actually like very accommodating and was part of the culture. Was it similar with this one as well? This one wasn't yards as much as it was private property. Maybe that's Uh, what I was thinking. Sorry. Uh, No, no. No, you're right. The last time I mentioned this, I was thinking like, like, especially on the Appalachian Trail, it was legitimately like neighborhoods, people's like homes. Um, The CDT is a bit more remote. So I was actually walking through a lot of property owned by ranchers. And there are so many cows on the CDT. So I was like walking through just, you know, like I had to crawl under so many barbed wire fences with approval, like the land was wow. like um there's an agreement with the landowner but it is still marked off as private property and you know I'm like slipping under barbed wire fences walking through like cow pastures just trying to stay on the CDT so it's not houses but it's like ranches or just like known private land Did you ever was- have to Oh sorry go ahead No it was just different no one told me about the barbed wire fences part And the first time I got to one of them, I looked at it and I was like, there's no gate. There's no thing to step over it. And the only way to go through it was to go under it. How much, how much cow, what do they call that cow plop? Like what's the, what do they call cow poop out there? What is the, there's like a fun terminology for it. Well, usually animal poop is called scat, but I think for, for cows, it's just cow poop. I'm just imagining that going through all that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, just, I know it's a bizarre question. I just, I've been to areas where there's just been a lot of cows and I, and they just poop everywhere. So I can only imagine having to deal with that. I guess it doesn't, you don't care because you've got your boots on. You're, you're, you're tracking through a hundred and something miles. You, you don't care about this, right? It, it doesn't you matter. do care. It does matter. <laughs> <laughs> we joked that the CDT is like the cow dung trail. There's so much cow poop. There's so much cow, so much. That's so what I assume. Cows. Yeah. You do get used to it, but it's incredible how many cows you're navigating, which 
honestly, sometimes herds of cows made me a little bit nervous, especially the bulls in the group are pretty mm-hmm. aggressive and you can like look at a herd and basically spot the bulls. Mm-hmm. And I've definitely had a few turn and look at me in a way that made me uncomfortable. And they kind of like moved their hoof in a <laughs> sort of way. Right. Right. And I just would talk to the cows, walk around them, tell could them you, what I'm doing. It was. Could you give us a sample crazy. right now? Could you put on your cow voice? Hi. Did cows. you move to? Did you I move to the cows? To. I did not move. <laughs> you but I to, did. Yeah, sorry. No, I did try to speak to them in a soft, gentle voice. <laughs> Did but you're supposed any- to, right? Isn't that a tactic with animals in wildlife in general that you you make yourself known and you kind of like talk out loud? Yes. I think you do want to sort of identify yourself as a human and most animals will recognize you for what you are. But this is husbandry. They're, they're not wild animals. So I feel like the rules are a little different, right? I mean, when you're dealing with this. That's true. Cows are different because they do know what human interactions are like. I wondered, I wondered a lot about cows and like how they felt about humans and if they understood the role we play in their lives, because it's generally not that positive. That's well, a whole say, did, you, did you free? <laughs> did you free any cows? I did not, but I did learn that those barbed wire fences do not withhold cows very well. Really? So when you wait, enter wait, this- wait, go away, wait, hold on, wait, go ahead. Can you go on a little bit more about that? What is it? I, I would have normally assumed that they do their job. Cows stay within the designated area via the barbed wire. What, what did you learn about while being out there in terms of the cows and their restraints? I think they, I saw some calves like go underneath some of the fences. And actually there were designated spots where you could open a gate. And then there was always a very clear sign that said, please close the gate behind you. So, you know, as a hiker, you are like opening and closing these gates, but they're actually really hard to open and close at times. So you do your best, but I'm sure people have left gates open and then the cows get out. And I really don't know what happens after that, because this is someone's property. Like, I imagine that causes some some problems if the cows do get through the gate. Um, Are Are they like branded in any way where they would be returned? Yeah, they, they a lot a lot of them had like the tags in their ears. Some of them had visible branding. Yeah. I didn't expect them to be such a feature of the trail, but they they were from the beginning to the end. Like I was just like, how did a cow get up here on this ridge? <laughs> Don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you you're entering private property and there's an agreement, an unspoken agreement between hikers and the property owners, but were you ever asked to identify yourself or did, was there like a protocol that if you were ever like, what do you say? What do you do for that? That's a good question. I do. I did not find myself in that scenario, but I know people who got off of the trail or were trying to follow a different road to a different point because a lot of the CDT is a choose your own adventure. And some of my friends did have run-ins with property owners who, you know, rode up on their horse or their ATV and they notified them that, you know, you're on my property. You're really not supposed to be here. I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to the trail. So some people got sort of like escorted back to where it was no longer private. Um, But that never really happened to me. There were definitely times where I was on guard, um, wondering if someone would come out and ask me what I was doing, but it didn't happen to me, fortunately. Why would that, why would that happen? Cause I thought there was an, there isn't an agreement. I guess it's not a wholesale agreement with everybody around that area. So people can pick and choose whether they want to participate. Like, you know, are they, yeah. putting, are they putting a sock on the door to let, to let you know, you know, either to come in or, or not come in? Like, is that, is that going on? Cause I, I would imagine that might be a little bit more helpful in those areas where they know that the, the, the fencing is near the trail to just sort of put some demarcation on that portion of the fence to let hikers know whether it's okay to come in or, or not a red light, green light, if you will. Yeah, that's a good point. And there are, there are a lot of like tr- no trespassing signs, private property signs, but a lot of times there might be like another tiny sign or an unofficial one that says like, this does not apply to hikers, or there's like a note of it in this app that um, all hikers, well, not all, but most through hikers use an app called far out guides. And it's like a map of the trail and it has like user generated comments on certain waypoints. 
So if you get to an area that's unclear, it might say like, hey, I saw the property owner come out and say, get off my property. And it's confusing because, yeah, like it made me stop and wonder, I thought they agreed to this. Why are they now <laughs> retracting their their side of this deal? But it must not be that clear in terms of how it's like, the, the land is vast. Like some people own so much land that I wonder if they don't fully understand like where the trail actually goes through. Um, I wonder if the real estate agent tells them that, discloses that during a purchase. I wonder. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I would like to know more about this. Um, I think generally speaking, it's like, it works. People get through just fine. It's not an issue, but there are like maybe one or two spots where people have actually had, you know, have actually met like the landowners. So you're saying it's vast and they're rolling up on ATVs or horses. You know, I'm trying to get a sense of, is it just them saying, this is my property. There's nothing particularly special about this over here. You're nowhere near my home. I just don't want you on here. Or are they, is something going on? Are they like using that land for some reason that you're kind of disrupting it? Or are they on patrol and they just randomly, or they have like cameras and they know you're there? Like how, how does, how do these interactions happen? And what's, what's the, I, you know, I don't want to like discount their feelings towards people trekking on their property, but what's the problem? I also wonder that, but I guess in general, if you don't know what through hikers are doing, you're like, why are these dirty, smelly people wandering through my land? And they look like they're going to sleep on it for a while. <laughs> like, you know, they probably just oh, like are squatters. You don't want them yeah, squatting on your property. Maybe. Type thing? Like we don't look like the most, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but we're not. I don't think people would necessarily want to invite us onto their land. And I, th I mean, but some people do, right? Like some people are very open about like, you can camp here and it's fine. But on the CDT, I did see like, I guess it's so tied to their maybe livelihood that they're protective over it. So it's their source of income and they just want to know what's going on. And I mean, I think people have probably like, they've seen hikers on their land and they let them go through without a problem too. So that's happening most of the time, but I don't have a really good concept of this, the amount of space people own. It's like too hard to tell from the trails, yeah. like from the perspective of being on the trail, but I think they're protective over their livelihood. Yeah. No, don't, don't worry. A lot of, uh, a lot of them don't know how much they, they own either. Cause like, it's like Bill Gates and a couple of billionaires anyway, that own all that land. So there's did you working it? <laughs> did you encounter anyone's property that is well known? I mean, is that do you know of that at all? Like you're like, oh, this is someone nationally recognized, or is it all just people you've never heard of? It's all people I've never heard of. Um, though I was unknowingly very close to the home that the Unabomber once lived in in Ed Kaczynski. Yeah. He lived in a cabin in the woods and it was very close to a spot that was just outside. Oh, what town was it? It was near, it was in Montana, but I found that out after the fact. Well, I'm wow. other than that unknown. But the, you saw the cabin or, or it's just the, it's just the spot. Does the cabin just still exist? Spot. Oh, I don't yeah. think the cabin exists, but apparently I was eerily close to where it once was. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So, so you had mentioned that you're you were in Montana for part of it, and yeah. that you're on ranches. And we often do wolf updates, um, and some of those updates take place in Montana, especially recent ones. And they had a recent wolf hunt. Did you have any encounters with wolves, or anyone speaking about wolves, or getting anyone's kind of opinion about it? I didn't know if that's like a popular topic. I don't know if you if that's a big thing out there in the way that we read about it, or if that's anything that people talk about when they're on the trail. Is this a big thing that people talk about? Um, the people who the are tracking these things, <laughs> they care about it. But when you think about what the, I guess the narrative is for ranchers and hunters, that this would be somewhat big. I mean, there's this push to either get, to either conserve them or to hunt them. Um, and for various reasons. So there is all of this lobbying effort around it. So is it a big thing for us out on the coasts? Probably not. 
But that's kind of why I'm asking, is this even discussed out there if you had mingled with any locals or if you had any encounter with wolves? Because the whole point of the so-called need for a wolf hunt is because there's a wolf problem and they're attacking ranchers and livestock and they're overrunning the areas. Uh, the populations are growing too big, even though they're being miscounted. So I was kind of wondering if if you had any perspective on that when you were out there. It didn't come up very often. I know there are efforts to sort of release wolves. So I think there was an effort in Colorado. And to be honest, I, I heard that and I felt just internal panic because I was like, great, another creature to be aware of in the wilderness. Um, but it didn't come up too often with ranchers or locals, maybe just once where someone noted that it is a threat to the livestock. So they're concerned from that perspective. But I don't have a grasp on how often or like where exactly the wolves are being released and sort of who's monitoring that process. But it is an interesting topic. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's interesting. interesting that you didn't run across anybody who talked about wolves or having any encounters with wolves necessarily. Like it, it, it didn't seem like it was a big deal to the hiker community hiking through those areas at the time. I mean, it's such a good point because you have the lobbyists that are pro hunt saying what a nuisance they are and a danger they are. And then you have these hikers who are going right through the wilderness, right through the ranches. And it's not this big thing on the trail where they're like, don't go this way. There's wolves or so-and-so had an encounter with a wolf yesterday. You're out there for 144 days and it's, it's kind of nothing. So it's just not the whole story, but it's a piece of it. So thank you. There are a lot of other, I guess there are a lot of other animals that are at the top of our lists of concerns and conversation too. I mean, not that they are wolves, but like similar, I guess I've heard a lot of coyotes at night. Like that's probably the closest thing. Thing to a wolf that yeah, I sure. experienced. Never actually seen a coyote as far as I can recall, but I've definitely heard them. They're pretty loud. And I guess I generally ran into a lot of hunters on the trail, more hunters than I have ever encountered in my life. But generally they were after elk. Like that was their primary animal. Why, why is that? Do you think that you ran into so many more hunters on this trail specifically? I think because the trail itself uses a lot of forest roads and there was some overlap where I think hunters sort of like enter the wilderness areas and set up camp and like pick spots to sort of like hunt from. So, and I think that that we must have been in like, I think pretty great elk habitat too. Like it was just conducive to large populations of elk. So were you hiking like on the way that they were walking to their car or is the trail going right through where they're like setting up shop to hunt and they're just like, yeah, that's the trail over there. Hopefully no one gets shot. Yeah. I I have to say I did wonder and sort of worry about that. I never had any issues because I think, I think that they're generally, well, I mean, I know, I don't know that much about hunting, but there are different weapons used, right? Like sometimes it's actual guns. Sometimes it's like, bow and arrow. And I think generally what I gathered from hunters is that they try to take ethical shots. So the likelihood of, of getting shot while hiking is still pretty low, but I was walking kind of along where they were. I mean, they were driving by also in their ATVs or I would walk by, you know, maybe like campers set up Jeeps, that kind of thing. So are that's a fair just, depiction. Wait, to, aren't just not allowed to drink or anything while they're out there? I mean, I don't know. I'm, wait, I'm just I, saying, I mean, that's a lot of, I feel like that's a lot of pressure to, on, uh, and trust on, uh, you know, just our fellow human man to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, hunters, perfectly safe people, just always on point. Never, never, you know, they don't drink out there. They don't do anything untoward. They're they're always looking for that that kill shot. They're, they're not going to just off their rifle at the first rustle of something in the bushes. Well, that was a fair thing because I felt like I mischaracterized it by saying, are you in danger just by walking? But you're saying like, no, they need to put eyes on it. They need to make sure that they're aimed. It's not just like they turn around spooked (laughs) shooting into the bush or or some first timer like 10 year old who doesn't know what they're doing. Well, Um, yeah, it's the first time for everything, right? I mean, they, you do have to take your children out. So, I mean, I I, I guess there's all the safety precautions. I, interesting. But it's a fair I, point. That's like, I'm happy you safe, said it like, right? that. I like that. Yeah. yeah. 
To be honest, it's probably just that I was afraid and I had to convince myself that I was not going to be shot by a hunter. So I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to accept that as reality and assume <laughs> that it is unlikely that I will be hurt by a hunter. <laughs> uh, in general, do hikers try to wear certain types of apparel that are either reflective or more colorful just in case? Is that something that hikers like? You know, traditionally they would. Or do you do, you do you talk out loud so that hunters hear you, like the animals? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they nice have... hunters, nice hunters. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I guess hunting season it depends on where you are and what time of year, but it seems like fall is the biggest concern, and usually it's advised to wear like a bright orange color, okay. like either a hat or a jacket or like a headband. Um, I didn't have anything like that on the CDT, um, but it was okay. Okay. I have to ask, do you just get eaten alive by bugs out there? There are sections and times of year where yes, you do. And when I was hiking through Wyoming, the mosquitoes were so bad. I was wearing rain gear, like my rain pants, my rain jacket, a head net. And it was so bad that I couldn't sit down long enough to to even eat. Like I had to like eat underneath my head net because the mosquitoes were just attacking me. But so it was a very small section, but it was very memorable and it varies based on the trail and the season, but there's usually like a solid week where you're just cursing the existence of mosquitoes. Did you know it going in? Is that part of the app? Like you're entering mosquito country now? Yeah. You kind of know, you kind of know. Um, Is it swampy? I guess what like the worst mosquito moments I had were near Yellowstone National Park. And I wouldn't say that it's swampy, but it is different. It's like geothermal um, terrain. And I think it was the time of it was like the time of the year where it was just peak mosquito hell because I knew people who were also in Montana experiencing the same thing. So I think it was a timing issue. The worst part about it was that not only was I battling mosquitoes in that section of trail, that's around where grizzly bears became a concern as well. And it was hard because, you know, you can't sleep with your food and you can't have it in your tent. So you're like trying to eat dinner, but not in your tent where you would be safe from mosquitoes, but then putting yourself at risk for a bear waking you up in the middle of the night. So it's like, you're just always juggling all these different variables. I think it's interesting that the bears was the main concern, not yeah, like again, not the wolves. It's the, it's always the bears. I always feel like whenever you talk, talk about the hiking community, anyway, it's always bears are the issue. Grizzly bears particularly terrified me because we don't have to worry about that in most parts of the U S except for the continental divide, basically North of Lander, Wyoming, all the way to the Canadian border. Your thinking about grizzly bears and taking the appropriate precautions. So this was the first trail that I carried bear spray with me um, and learned how to use it because it's, it's pretty effective at deterring grizzlies because they will, they will maul you. I mean, they most won't like, you'll probably be okay. Again, like a script that I repeated to myself over and over again, but there's still a risk. Yeah. Most of the time it just takes once. Right. I mean, most of the time can hold up to be true and you could still get hurt. So it's good to take precautions. And it took me until my second to last night on trail to see grizzlies. So I worried for months. And then when I was in Glacier National Park, I saw a mother and three cubs run through the campsite that I was in. And if I wasn't with about eight other people, I probably would have been terrified. But I had pretty good group support and the bears had wanted nothing to do with us, but that's kind of the worst case scenario. You really don't want to come across a mother and her cubs. They looked very cute. I was taken aback by how cute, but I was like, wait, <laughs> terrified also. <laughs> when, when you so, say group support, is that because it's by the numbers? Like you just feel like now it's a one out of eight chance that it's me. Pretty much. Okay. I felt like we could scare the grizzlies away if we oh, had collectively. To. Gotcha. collectively. Okay. Um, I don't, I think it would be more unlikely that it would come after us as a group. And it was known, um, when I got to that campsite, cause there are designated spots in glacier and someone who already got there was like, Hey, just so you know, one of the park rangers told us 
that there's a mother and cubs that runs through this campsite every night, but typically runs through and keeps going. So typically, typically I'm, I was like, I'm going to hang on to that language of typically, and I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> so tell me the first word that comes to mind. Pacific Crest Trail. Views. Appalachian Trail. Green Tunnel. Continental Divide. Remote. Nice. Nice. Now, what? Tell, so the Green Tunnel stuck out. What's, what's that? On the Appalachian Trail, you rarely, you know, get the sort of grand views of the land like you're generally in the trees it is more of a walk in the woods so they call it the green tunnel because you're generally walking through like rhododendron thickets or just like forests whereas on the pacific crest trail you tend to be above tree line most of the time so you're just getting these like expansive views of sort of high alpine areas or desert or Still, you're in the forest, but just it's not the like defining feature. That's great. You did so much better. I almost didn't want to ask you that because if someone was to ask me, I totally would botch the whole thing. I'm not good on the spot like that, but I was really impressed. Nice job. I'm not good on the spot either. So I'm <laughs> glad it worked out. <laughs> you're good enough. Thank you. Good enough. Good enough. That's all that matters. All I mean, matters. so do you have a favorite or is it like they're all amazing for different reasons? Both. They're all amazing for different reasons, but now the CDT is my favorite. And I was skeptical at first. I was, I was a little bit um, unsure of my decision to hike the CDT when I started. I mean, I've, I've wanted to do it. I was sure of it, but I was walking through the boot heel of New Mexico pretty much by myself because not that many people were around me and it was hot, hotter than I've ever hiked in like hundred degree plus days, just like dry cows everywhere. I'm walking these random roads and I'm like, what am I doing? But over time, I think the CDT was everything that I like wanted and needed it to be. So I got this really great balance of solitude and autonomy, but also I did make really great friends. I kind of developed a trail family as I went along but even when I was with them and had the support of having people around me, I still was always like making my own decisions for myself, like hiking my own hike, as they say. So it was a really nice blend of like really being in the wilderness, like experiencing these remote areas, sometimes by myself, sometimes with other people and like really appreciating the outdoors itself. Like I feel like I was really out there, which I, I'm not sure I quite got um, in the same way on the other two trails and the, the community was smaller, but deeper. So like most people on the CDT had hiked the AT or the PCT. Most had hiked the PCT. Most say they'll never hike the AT, which I will stand by the AT (laughs) forever. Um, so it was interesting to have all of these sort of overlapping connections. Like I met a lot of people who were on the PCT in 2019 as well. And you know, you have this immediate bond and understanding, even if I didn't meet them on that trail. Um, and then I'm going through like these beautiful areas, like Glacier National Park, Yellowstone National Park, the Wind River Range. Like it was, it was on another level. So like high highs, low lows, but in the end, like a really good blend of views and people, which kind of like tied together my PCT and AT experiences. It sounds like it's the level of experience that I feel like you're drawn to here, because I feel like in the past, uh, not only did you not have a lot of experience, but I felt like a lot of the people you were also hiking with were relatively novice hikers. There was not many people who had like a, a, you know, a breadth of hiking experience under their belt necessarily. It feels like this is the trail, you know, this is the, this is the, uh, this is like Thunderdome. Like this is, these are the people who know what they're doing. And so when they get together, they have a better understanding. Not, not a lot of clingers. I felt like you, you, you know, I, I kind of want you to get a little bit more into the 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 hiking family on this trail a little bit, uh, just because uh, you've 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 sort of discussed it with a bit of a here. It feels a lot more um, optimistic than I feel like you have in the past. Yeah, it was different. It was different because I went into it knowing what I wanted. Um, 
And I think you're right. I think people were more experienced and just the, the whole culture and mindset around the CDT is very different. Um, there are a lot of different, and like, and we touched on this a little bit last time too. Like there are some alternates, like you can choose your own path. There's like one designated line, but people sort of, it's like encouraged to take a different route. Um, it's a little bit more route finding and less you're going to walk from point A to point B on this one trail. And it honestly, that as a rigid person, who's kind of a purist when it comes to trails, it was very difficult to sort of embrace that and be okay with taking alternate paths, you know, on the fly, like just deciding, okay, you know what? I could go this way. Why don't I try that? It's more beautiful or it's shorter. So there was just like a lot of freedom to make different decisions. And I think that people that I was around were thinking outside of the box a bit more. And so people were comfortable making their own decisions and sort of standing by them. So it's like, you know, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this and I'll see you in town or I'll see you in a couple of days. Like there was a lot of flexibility and sort of open-mindedness when it came to experiencing the trail. You mentioned last time, and Antoine kind of brought it up, the trail families. And it, and it is funny when he's when he just mentioned it in that way. Like there was this, I think it was mixed feelings, but it was like kind of theme that was coming through. But I also remember you saying that at certain stopping points, you could decide to stay longer or, or go faster to kind of like leave people behind and get a new group. Did you find that that was kind of the same here, or did you stick with the same group more or less, even though they might've lagged or got ahead of them, you always kind of returned or did you, whether it was intentional or not find new groups of people? It's, uh, let's see, actually the group pretty much stuck together. It formed in Colorado. And even though there were a few different configurations, um, the core of the group pretty much made it to Canada together with like a few additions to the group. Um, so I think for the most part, it, it stayed together in a way, I guess we lost a few people right at the start of Colorado because it's, it's a tricky area. There's a lot of snow and I think people have different feelings about it. So I felt fortunate that I was with three other people that felt fairly confident in the snow, like with, with that kind of, um, snow travel. And so the group that I was in for the first couple of days split sort of based on that. But from there to the end, it stayed very consistent. There was kind just, of like a bubble. I'm sorry. I'm just fascinated. The, the way that you're talking about it, I'm like listening as if it's a movie, but I'm also very aware that you lived and breathed and sweat and cried through this probably like, Oh yeah. You know, we're comfortable with like snow, whatever, how hard, like, how much of it are we not really understanding? Like it was it, uh, just trekking through Colorado in the snow and it, it just people dropped off because of how difficult it was, but you were three it, people who knew what they were doing and you made it through. I mean, is there just like a, an anecdote or a story of how hard it really was? That's oh, it is. It's hard to come back from a through hike because it's very difficult to convey all of the like micro experiences that occur on a daily basis. And it was really hard. I mean, sometimes it's not right. Sometimes it's beautiful and you're just walking along and it's fine. But most of the CDT required a lot of focus and attention. And there, there were a few days in early Colorado in the San Juan mountains where I encountered snow and you're at like 11,000, 12,000 feet. So you're up there. I got very lucky. It was a pretty, pretty low snow year. So not um, not terrible, like definitely manageable, but it's so hard to explain, but there was just sort of like the, the trail kind of contours around a mountain. And like in this one day, I'm like being nearly blown off the mountain at 70 mile per hour winds and like, okay, that's fine. I, I survived that. And then I get to this like snowy traverse where I have to take out my ice axe and my micro spikes and I'm just taking the most careful steps one after another. And this was like the first time I was back in snow since the Sierra on the PCT. So 
I was just very focused. I shed a few tears. I had a really good friend with me. So he was like, you got this, you're going to be fine. But you know, if you zoom out, I'm, I'm at like 12,000 feet traversing the side of a mountain with like four other people, three or four other people just sticking my ice axe into the side, taking careful steps and hoping not to slide down. It's just, it's bizarre. <laughs> it's a bizarre way to live. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you're evoking the, uh, you know, the imagery of the fellowship of the ring in my I, head. I, I didn't want to say it. I, I, I didn't well, that's all I can think of. I mean, you're talking about your fellowship. You're talking about your people. Uh, you, you even said it. You're putting your ice, your ice axe into the ground. And, I'm, and so I was like, I'm, I'm imagining Maxine with a, with a mask, with a big spear. Uh, you're wearing a non orange uh, wizard hat. Uh, the wind is blowing in your face. Someone's yelling. We have to go back. We have to turn back. Another person's like, we could go through the mountain, but of course the dwarves, they, they delve too deep. Stop. You know, is that, is that, is that what you, are we, are we You're, simpatico? Are we, is, that's are we it. in line? That's got exactly, it. Okay. I think, I think that's definitely it for anyone I, I that needs the I imagery in their head. That's it. That's way that's better it. than I could have done. That's so much closer <laughs> to reality. <laughs> I love now, that. You did this alone though, right? Like you started out alone. I did. This was my most solo effort. Um, but again, always a trail community around. I will say though, the first 400 miles of New Mexico, I was really alone. And most of the time, even when I had a group, I was the slower one in the group. So I tended to be behind. So, you know, I would spend most of the day hiking by myself. Um, but there were also periods where I was like hiking, you know, not side by side, but as close as you could get to that with people um, because people make the trail. And so it's nice to share things, but everyone wants to go their own pace. Um, so you get a lot of time alone and the CDT was probably, I mean, it is like the least trafficked trail of of the three i was looking at how many people had reported finishing it this year because i was curious myself and so far only like 60 people said that they completed it and it's about like a it it technically spans like 3000 miles so 60 people over 3000 miles granted i know for sure there's more than 60 people that were on the trail this year like that's probably northbounders not including southbounders but Either way, it's in the hundreds. And, you know, even if you have your group, you're still not seeing other people outside of your group either. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. One of 60. I mean, it, let's say that it is 60. I'd just say that's an incredible feat. Uh, I, I did want to ask just a little bit, uh, not to go completely back into the the uh, the Gandalf uh, mountain bit, but yeah, the, the height. It was it difficult to breathe. Like, did you experience any of that, or is it still too low for any kind of altitude effectiveness? You know, I got lucky that for the entirety of the trail, for the most part, I was fine at altitude. Like, at like at ten thousand to fourteen thousand feet. It wasn't until, again, it's kind of hard to explain this, but I, I missed a two point five mile section of trail in Colorado because of bad weather. And because I'm sort of a purist, continuous footpath person, I went back to Colorado after I got to Canada with some of my friends and hiked this short section of trail that um, was at around 13,000, 14,000 feet. And I was up there for maybe like, like three hours or so. And I got super altitude sick. Like it had never happened to me before. And I felt really nauseous, lightheaded. My decision-making felt compromised. I was like taking these steps that felt foreign to me, but I had no choice because the only way to get out of that scenario was to keep hiking. And thankfully, um, at the end of this like short, but very high elevation hike, there was um, a pair of men having lunch in their Jeep at like 14, well, at 13,000 feet, they decided to drive up this like terrible dirt Jeep road to have lunch. And we kind of explained like my scenario. I was like, I really don't feel well. And the only way to like improve in that situation is to get down to a lower elevation as rapidly as you can. And they were like, we're just packing up. Like, we'll take you all down the road. Like, don't worry about it. We'll get you off of this mountain. And I was just like, I don't want to be dramatic, but I feel like you're saving my life. And <laughs> 
they, they took us down. It was a pretty bumpy road, but I got very lucky because it would have taken me a lot longer on foot. So that was my first experience with altitude sickness. I was very glad that it had not happened before that. Um, I think it's because even in Montana, I wasn't really at that high of an elevation towards the end. So I was like not acclimated anymore. And I think it was kind of a shock to my system. Do do you or any of the other people like take like Diamox or anything like that for altitude sickness preventively, like prophylactically? No one took it on this trip. I definitely thought about it because when I went to Colorado two years ago, I did take it ahead of time and like it helped. It it seemed to help at least because I went from, you know, like sea level to 14,000 feet, which felt pretty extreme. Um, but I didn't have time to get that prescription filled. So I just, <laughs> <without it. laughs> I probably should have taken it on my like return to Colorado because yeah, I just think I lost all of that, like ac- that acclimating that I had done leading up to Colorado the first time it was a little bit more gradual. And this was kind of like, boom, you're at 14,000 feet. And this is what it feels like. It feels terrible. <laughs> David, did you say prophylactically? Yeah. Like I had a time, like, like through your butt. <laughs> no, but that's not what that means. <laughs> I just, bro. You have me like <laughs> you have me confused with I think it no, is by my mouth. No. no, I guess it's just a no just medicine that's um no, it's to, to take it preventatively disease. before you need it. Yeah. What are you but talking this about? It's a prophylactic in terms of the butt one. I don't know. God, you like really cut me to the core for a second there. I like you really called into <laughs> question what I was pretty confident that I knew. Can you please make that the intro of this episode? It's a teaser. <laughs> Does it mean taking it through the butt? <laughs> Have uh, you been told to take something prophylactically before, Antoine? <laughs> Do we need to have a conversation? Antoine feels abused. But I know what you mean. It has the connotation. Like, there's another word that is very close to it, right? That is. There must be. There must be. There must be. I am not going to Google that. <laughs> no, neither am I. I don't want it in my history. Um, so anyway, I had another question while Antoine tries to figure out his past. <laughs> I <laughs> had, you mentioned being alone. And it's funny because not that I think of myself as any solitary creature, but working from home and, and stuff, I do deal with people through Zoom and stuff, but I spend some time alone and I generally don't mind being alone, but I've never actually been tested. You know, I, I've never been alone necessarily when I didn't want to be. And, you know, you seem comfortable being alone. You've kind of relished in it to a degree, but is there a duration of time that really does start to weigh on you heavily or have you not reached that limit yet? I, it's interesting. I feel comfortable with it kind of after the fact. And I guess I've had to talk myself through being alone to the point where I am comfortable in the moment too. I'd say on the CDT, there was a part in the Gila River wilderness where I was alone for almost 48 hours. I didn't see another person. And that's the longest I've gone without seeing a human. I actually thought I saw a person and it was a bear. And I was like, I'm alone out here. God, (laughs) it kind of gives uh, credence to the whole like Yeti or Bigfoot thing, right? You're, you're, you're out there alone and you think it's a human, but it's actually a bear. And then it's Bigfoot. Yeah. And I don't know. It's a stretch, but <laughs> I, I was sure these were bears, but I was very upset because I was like, I really wanted to see a person because I'm like in this Canyon by myself. And I know that there are people just ahead of me and just behind me, but it really felt like I'd have to wait hours, if not a day to see somebody probably just hours in reality. So I'd say like 48 hours was kind of pushing my limit where I was like, I don't love this. I know I can do it, but I'd prefer to see another person right now. And I actually, I hiked the, um, fun fact, I hiked another trail after the CDT, which is kind of to me interesting because it's called the Benton Mackay trail. And just real quick, it's 300 miles. It goes through the Smokies and goes down to Springer mountain. So my thought was like, I'm going to hike this trail back to Springer mountain where my whole triple crown pursuit started. Cause that's where the AT begins. And I was very alone on that trail, like more so than 
any trail that I've hiked before, including the long trail, which was also a very solo endeavor. And I camped alone, um, like eight out of 12 nights on trail. And that was the most, like, that was the, like the highest percentage of time I had spent on a trail by myself. Did you find that to be unnerving? I I almost wanted to ask you, was that the hardest because you're alone and you feel more vulnerable? Like, was that, was that almost like a, um, not like a miscalculation, but like, a, like, like over, not overconfidence, but it was it a situation where you're like, oh, it's just a 300 mile one. It's nothing compared to these big ones. I'm just going to jump into it. And then you're like, whoa, or no, is it just, I was lonely, but I got this. It was a mixture of the two. It definitely made me think, okay, I'm done with through hiking for now. I got, I've, I got my fill. Um, and, but like looking back on it, I really appreciate the experience because when you're alone, you really do have to think through things differently. Like you can wish with all of your might that you weren't setting up your tent by yourself and that you weren't hearing rustling in the leaves outside, wondering if it's a bear or a wild boar or a person, but you're like, I have no choice but to accept this reality and go to sleep and it'll probably be fine. So like, I kind of, I I hate the time alone and I love it because it forces me into this mental space where I have no choice. Like there was no amount of hiking that I could have done on any of the days I was on the Benton Mackay trail where I could have like gotten to a point where I probably would have camped with someone. It was like that, the the number of hikers out there was so small, like at least the, the CDT is similar, but I was traveling with a group, like in a, in the bubble, as they say. So most of the time I was camping with other people and seeing other people throughout the day, but there were actually like compared to the AT and the PCT, I still spent like the most, uh, nights camping alone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like, I don't know. I, I have such a love hate relationship with it. I like to see what I can do when I'm by myself and, you know, you prove to yourself that you can make it through the night. But the experience, the anxiety, it's a lot of times. You come out stronger, but it looks, I mean, you are you seem normal now. It's not like you had your Jack Nicholson shining moment where the cabin fever got to you. So you haven't hit your limit yet. Not yet. No, I haven't <laughs> spent enough time like in, uh, yeah, I think because I was still seeing day hikers even on the Benton Mackay Trail. Like, I really think that that one experience where I didn't see someone for like 48 hours, that was the most I'd gone with truly not seeing another person and really not having outside communication either. So it was, it was unsettling. I feel like NASA should be like consulting with hikers. They always talk about the long trips in space and how that plays on your psyche. I feel like there's a lot to be learned here. Yeah, there probably is. And I mean, it depends on who you talk to as well. Like there are plenty of people who have hiked these big three trails who will say they spent like the entire time alone. So it's partly what you're looking for. Um, I think the CDT will always inherently be a more like lonely trail until it gets really popular, which it's on the rise. So maybe it'll change, but it's, it's kind of like, what do you want from the trail? Do you want to be with people? If so, you could probably find a group pretty quickly. I'm, I'm going to ask something a little deep. So you're going to have to dig for this one. Okay. Do you think that because I mean you're an only child, I could I could I could say that just because right that I I could describe you as that. You can describe me as an only child. Okay. Do you feel that there is any kind of mental preparedness that comes like deep when you talk to other hikers, do you find that they are, you know, one of 18? You know, or are they do you find them that they, you know, I don't know if you've ever asked or if you've ever thought of it before, but I'm just I'm I'm wondering. I'm just wondering. It does come up. Like, do these other people that I'm hiking with have like larger families. Well, uh, yeah. Well, like, well yes. Yeah. I guess I'm just saying like, do you feel that there is um, it is easier to maybe find that mental fortitude of being able to withstand being alone oh. for such a, a long duration of time in part because it's, you know, it might be part of that deep seated uh, only childness. I, I don't know. That's a really great question. I think there is some truth to that. I think I have a pretty above average, comfort level with being alone. Um, most of the people that I met and hiked with have like one or two siblings on average. Most aren't <coughs> only one other person in my group. 
did not have siblings. Um, but I think, yeah, like being raised as an only child, I, I like spent a lot of time alone. So maybe I I had a better, yeah, maybe it's easier for me. It's an interesting survey. That's a a survey I would love to conduct among hikers in general, especially the more desolate trials trails to say like, uh, is there any correlation there between hiking desolate trails and being an only child? There's so much opportunity for data collection and analysis here. There really is. Yeah. There's one person who runs a through hiker survey for the PCT and the CDT every year. And I've relied on it in the past for just like, you know, it's, it's good to see sort of the trends in like the people who succeed at the through hike versus fail. Like he he does a really good job of analyzing the data he can get. Um, but I'm like, I want to see it because I wonder if there's any other like interesting insights to be gathered there. Yeah. I mean, right, right off the bat, as soon as you were talking about the ranchers that are friendly versus unfriendly, I was like, oh my God, there's such a good app for that. You could, <laughs> you could just crowdsource collect. It's, it's a, it's a Tinder for, for a hiker, for uh ranchers who are more am- amicable to having you on their land. If you will. <laughs> get a certain number of stars, like an Uber rating. It's like four, 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 4.5 star for friendly rancher, right? You get friendly, unfriendly, downright disgusting. Stay as far away from this person as, as humanly possible. 4.5 cows. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's see, it's, it's, it's writing itself. So if any, if any app developers have to be listening to our, uh, our little show here, I think the, I think there's an idea that's out there for you. So I have a goofy question, sort of. So for, forgive the examples, <clears throat> um, but there are movies <clears throat> like Jaws or Twister or like Lake Placid where you have like these professionals. So like you would be like a professional, right? And so would all your fellow hikers. But in the movies, they kind of like get a little campy and there's always like the minimalist, like the Quintin from, from, uh, from Jaws. I think that's his name, right, Antoine, if I remember that guy correctly, or I Another co captain, okay, um, or or the twister, uh, Bill Paxton, right? Who's like the the guy? Uh, so you have like the minimalist, but he's the experienced person, and then you have like the inexperienced, but like the techie guy or the techie person. And I was curious if the trail is kind of divided up into that too, amongst the professionals, amongst the experienced folk to a degree, where you have people who are just like down to earth, minimalist, doing the bare necessities, or the people that come with all the gadgets and gizmos and and if that is the case, how does that, do they mix? Before you answer, Maxine, I think Jamie's trying to ask you, if you just took a, a, a through hiker family, could you in fact send them on a mission to break apart an asteroid that may or may not be coming to destroy the earth? Uh, because they're a rag, because <laughs> t- obviously every through family is nothing more than a ragtag bunch of misfits who have all different walks of life that uh, have come together in order to accomplish uh, an, an extraordinary feat. Obviously. No, that's no, not I'm, what so, I'm saying. Maxine, please. It, was there a, a, what's the name? Steve Buscemi in your, in your, uh, in your through family? Um, no. If you, have you seen Twister? It's the guy that was plays Robin Hood and men in tights. He's like the tech dude. The, the guy that's like, has is like super well-funded. So this would be like a really rich person who is just, has all the technology at his disposal. Or you have the people who just by experience know how to get by and, whether they have money or not, they're not spending it on on support for the in the trail. Well, okay. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> that that like whole genre of like a team of people has to stop an asteroid from hitting Earth is like my favorite sci-fi movie plot. Number one, number two. If my trail family had to address a situation like that, it would be a complete disaster. But it would be hilarious. So it would be very entertaining. But most likely, the asteroid would hit Earth. So okay, Okay. everyone brings their strengths and their weaknesses with them. And it is this ragtag group of people, right? Like really random, but it works so well. You know, we, we stood the test of weather and terrain and time and it's incredible. Actually, everyone kind of brought their different strengths. I mean, everyone, and, and I would say though, that everyone was experienced minimalist and willing to endure like there's like a high level of comfort with suffering but ridiculous like ridiculous suffering we we opted 
you know, we would take zero days, but then we would be, let's say we joked that once we got like 50 miles from town, like, you know, you'd, you'd hike on the trail for basically like hundred mile stretches and it's like town to town. So you get your supplies in each, each town, take a shower, do laundry. Whenever we were 50 miles within town limit, <laughs> we would joke like, oh, we could just hike to town today. And a couple of times we hiked like 50 miles to just make it, make it for breakfast <laughs> the next day. <laughs> you know, this involves like hiking through the night for hours, but you're like, this sounds like a great idea because I really want coffee. So like, I'm willing to hike more now so I can hike less tomorrow. So everyone had this like weird, like <laughs> psychological drive for type two fun. And I think that's what brought us together. Like we all wanted to achieve this one kind of wacky. There's something primal about that though. Like going back to like the day where there was no transportation and with, when you wanted something, you had to earn it. And yeah, it was probably maybe not, maybe totally worth it in the end, but you had to make a commitment to get there to find out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jamie Don't took it to a primal. I mean, I, I immediately just said, you know, this is, again, it's, this sounds like Oregon Trail. It does. Just sounds like the decisions you make. You know, you needed some provisions. You really wanted that, those the, those extra bit of um, jerky and, and a couple extra bullets just for the road. So you, so you ford the river. And uh, you may have lost someone along the way. I know that time is, you know, uh, I appreciate that you're here with us, but I know time is not infinite. Climate change. I feel like we have not discussed that aspect of this trail in particular. Did you notice anything? Was there anything that was extra, that was out of the ordinary that a lot of the hikers were talking about uh, this past year uh, with regard to this trail? I thought about this more because of our, our last conversation. So I was like on alert. I was like, am I seeing anything that stands out to me? Um, I guess, uh, I mean, the fires were an issue this year, pretty much right off the bat, which was uh, unexpected to me. Like, again, I really don't know if I can speak to climate change specifically. Like, I don't know, like the full. Yeah, yeah, naturally. Yeah, we're not asking you to stand (laughs) on ceremony and explain climate change and how it's impacting. uh, But I can say fires were an issue. Fires were an issue on the CDT this year and on the PCT, probably more problematic on the PCT, if anything. But in New Mexico, 250 miles of trail closed right away. So like I had to like bypass that and that's why I had to go back. Um, But I think it was just very dry, very windy. I'd say like wind played a very big role this year. Maybe it's the same in in previous years too, but again, this might be worth fact checking, but I heard that. So wind obviously like spreading the fires and whatnot, but then the snow levels in like the Southern part of Colorado were, were below average. And I think it's because the winds were so high that they were blowing dirt onto the snow, which was like, making the snow melt faster, but only like in a certain part of Colorado. This is just like really an, an uh, like a weather <laughs> observation more than anything. That's but I do wonder about that and sort of like the implications of that, because it wasn't great that the snow levels were low. Like mm-hmm. from a through hiker perspective, it was nice. I was like, well, this is good. I can make it through that part. But obviously that has other implications. So that might that might be a broader issue, but one that I need to look into. Did you find the temperatures during the summer to be like where people were saying that it was any was it hotter than usual at all, or or was it just run of the mill? Seemed run of the mill. Okay. I mean, New Mexico is just really hot. Um, but you know, I did walk through a lot of burn areas, so areas that were previously on on fire. And that's definitely hard to see because, you know, it's just like these charred forests um, that will take, I don't know, life lifetimes to, to grow back. So I think a lot of damage had been previously done. Again, this is something I really need to like familiarize myself with more with like wildfires and land management and all of that. Okay. No, no I appreciate Sorry, it. Sorry, it's not uh, as informative. Yeah. 
I just, I just like to hear it from the horse's mouth. You know, you're out there, you're in the field. I just like to hear what people are talking about. We're on the ground. We're seeing this kind of stuff firsthand. So, uh, no, I appreciate it. Uh, that's that's it's, it's it's good. It's good to to have firsthand uh, accounts of what's going on out there. Fires are bad in the West. That is my takeaway, and they're becoming an increasingly large problem. Well, okay. I mean, it's climate change, not the fact that there are fires, but the intensity, the frequency how much they're destroying. That's just becoming more and more. So you're safe to say that. Yeah. I, I had some rapid fire questions. Okay. Let's see. Maybe not, the first one might not be as rapid fire, but last time you had mentioned currency on the trail. And I was curious now that you've been on three and, and many other hikes, is the currency always the same? And like, what was the current, what was like, I don't know if it was the the most currency or your favorite. Like, what was what was being traded amongst the the hikers? Oh, I guess there's there's some food sharing and some uh, cable sharing. <laughs> what does that mean, cable? Very, like, your for instance, I have a Garmin watch, right? And I carried my Garmin charger to connect to my external battery pack. For some reason, two people in my trail family did not have their own. So like I was usually lending it to them. Um, so you just share a lot of things. And sometimes it'll be like toothpaste. Sometimes one person will carry a tube of toothpaste and then at night be like, who needs toothpaste? Um, fuel is another thing that's sometimes shared, but not as commonly, I guess. Um, and then the other, just like a snack trade. Okay. So in terms of sharing, it's the essentials, but when it comes to trading, it's, it's food. It sounds like food. Yeah. You would trade food. Okay. Um, in now that you've done three and again, many others, do you feel whether it was planned or not that each of the trails have been a a progression difficulty for you, or has it kind of just been all over or are they kind of all difficult and easy in their own way? I think it's a blend, but the CDT really did feel like the most difficult of them all, mostly because it was like multiple difficult variables at once. Like it was never just one concern. It was like mosquitoes and grizzly bears or like lightning and being at 13,000 feet. So the, the hazards, let's say, came in pairs, whereas on the AT and the PCT, it was more like okay, I'm worrying about this one thing. Like right now I'm really worried about traversing the snow, but I'm not necessarily worried about an incoming thunderstorm. Like there, there were, they were more isolated. Whereas I feel like the CDT typically through what my trail family would call a wild card at you every day. So you'd wake up and you'd be like, great day. It's going to be wonderful. And then it's 75, 70 mile per hour winds blowing you off of a ridge. And that's your wild card for the day. You know. It's a lot of my gear broke on this trail. I mean, I was able to repair it while I was hiking, but it definitely like put everything to the test. Like one night my tent pole snapped and I was like, of course my tent pole snapped. I'm on the CDT. (laughs) This has never happened to me before. Just little things like that. They add up and they, they make it hard. So I would say CDT is definitely the hardest of the three, in my opinion. Did you know that going in that that would be that that was something you wanted to keep till last or eight last in terms of this, this trifecta? Yes. And it's pretty common to keep the CDT um, for the end though. Two people in my group were hiking the CDT as their first through hike. And I did meet um, a handful of people this year who, who were tackling it as their first through, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that most people don't want to hike the Appalachian trail. And then they apply for a PCT permit and don't get it. So they're like, well, in terms of like the overall terrain and sort of landscape, the CDT is more similar to the PCT. So I think a lot of people found themselves on the CDT and they did really well. Like I think people thrived, but, um, I think, I think it makes sense to keep it for the the end because it is just, it's kind of like a, combination of all the skills you would use on the other trails all right i have three questions one and this is really like selfish for me i want to go to like they have these like dark sky designated areas where you apparently and there's different 
levels and they have different names. But basically, you can look up and see the center of the Milky Way. Like, I want to look up and see the Milky Way. Have you been anywhere where you can confirm that with your eyes alone, you could look up and see the Milky Way? Ooh, I feel like it happened quite a few times. It's, it's, I'm ashamed to say this, but a lot of times I'm in my tent at night, which is really a shame. Um, I would say the Wind River Range is very remote in Wyoming. And I recall looking at the sky there. Actually, New Mexico, for the most part, I feel like when I looked up, the, the whole CD, the whole divide, actually, now that I think about it, you're very rarely near any sort of like light pollution. So if you just take the time on a clear night to look at the sky, you're probably going to see the Milky Way. Okay. And two hold questions. Hold on, hold on. I want to let oh. you off the hook a little bit with this one. Okay, how go ahead. Cold, how cold is it at night? Um, well, I think probably the coldest was like in the, tw- maybe like the low twenties at times, like in Colorado at elevation, but I hiked it going northbound and that was my experience. I'm pretty sure people who hiked southbound experienced like single digit temperatures because they were out there like later in the season. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that when you're like, you know, you're, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm in my tent at night. It's like, because you might freeze to death. Otherwise. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yes. Yes. I was cold. <laughs> so, so that's why you're not up, you know, with your hands back behind your head. Uh, you know, your legs crossed, just uh, pondering the mysteries of the universe, looking into the night skies, because while you're doing that, icicles are forming and you're slowly uh, you're hypothermia into uh, to death. I, I, I was made it a verb just to illustrate how ridiculous are... JV's scenario was proposed to you. No, no, it's but ridiculous. I asked you know. saw the night sky. A lot of you would. I mean, I should see the night sky. I saw the night sky every night, but I was <laughs> cold a lot of the times. A lot of people will like cowboy camp, which is like camping without your tent. Like you just set up your sleeping bag on top of like a ground sheet. And I only did that a few times just because I like my tent. I like my thin, thin walls. But there were times where I was like, oh, it is nice. Like falling asleep, like looking at the sky, like it, it just makes you feel very small in like a a good way, you know? So that's beautiful. I would recommend cowboy camping along the divide and that's probably the best way to get like a solid view of the night sky how do you stay warm if you're cowboy camping your sleeping bag typically keeps you pretty warm like mine was rated for 10 degrees so okay it was was still warm just the one of the nights that i cowboy camped uh i did it with everyone around me we were all like yeah let's not use our tents and then at 5 a.m it was like a complete downpour like imagine someone turns a shower on you like there was no warning no like drips it was just like full on downpour. Everything got soaked. And I was like, this is why I don't cowboy camp. <laughs> <laughs> so two questions for any hikers or, or new hikers or people interested in hiking that may find this helpful. What are three hiking essentials? Three hiking essentials. I would say like the, what is referred to as the big three, like your, your backpack. So your pack your sleeping bag and your tent are the most crucial. And if someone is interested in getting into hiking, what should, what should they do first? If someone came up to you and are like, Maxine, Oh my God, it's so great to meet you. I want to get into hiking. How can I get started? Where do you point them? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing they need to do is sort of like, are you talking about like through hiking or sort of day hiking? Let's do through hiking. Okay. Through hiking, I'd say like my first question to them would be like, why? Like, I think they need to examine what they're looking for and why they want to through hike, because I think that guides the next steps. But there are some like good resources out there. Like there's this um, blog website called The Trek. They have a podcast of their own called Backpacker Radio that interviews a lot of hiker through hikers specifically. Um, that's a really great resource and one that I relied on pretty heavily when I started. And then there's a like hiker backpacker named Andrew Skirka, who has a lot of information about like ultralight hiking. And I think just like turning to social media, finding people who have hiked these trails and looking through their experiences. Now, did you ask which type of hiking? Because one generally follows the other. Does no one go into through hiking? Is it day hiking first for everyone? I think people tend to dabble with hiking and then commit to a through hike. I'd actually be really interested to know like what the most common sort of entry point is because 
a lot of people who through hike haven't gone on backpacking trips. Like most people just sort of jump into through hiking as their first like outdoor multi-night uh, experience. But I have to imagine they're hiking. Like most people are going on day hikes and climbing mountains and like they're in the outdoor world, but there's probably like some ultra runner types that end up through hiking. Any um, easy advice for the day hiker or someone who wants to get in, in into that as a first timer? For the day hiker, um, I would say just find like a local trail that you feel comfortable going out on. Um, but to always check, depending on like where you are, especially since I'm in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, weather can be really different from like the valley to the, the summit. So checking like the mountain forecasts, like what is the weather going to be like on the summit above tree line? Um, I would just be really aware of that because I think a lot of beginner hikers don't take that into account. And like fatalities really do happen. There's, there was one recently here. Um, and it, it seems very preventable. Um, you know, but everyone kind of makes mistakes too, but I'd say like, check the weather, find a, a hike that feels like within your sort of comfort zone, grab a friend, maybe see if you That's like fantastic it. advice. That's great. That's great advice. Yeah. So that was great. That was great. Thanks Maxine. Thank you for, for joining having us. me on. It's Thank you for coming. Very it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> made it a very special 100. I hope so. I hope that you I did. Can. Thanks for having me on your 100th episode. It feels special from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be the first robot guest guest person in our new animation in YouTube. We have, I was wondering uh, about this. I was like, how will I be presented in the YouTube video? You'll be, you, that will be your honorary robot. Can you put a little backpack on it? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? There's a lot of Easter eggs in that animation if you haven't watched it already. And you may really? want to look, you may want to look towards the back left, okay. back center left next time you see it. And you've inspired, you've inspired a piece of that. So I'm going to look carefully. I love it. It's just such a cool feature. Do a lot of people watch on YouTube? Yeah, we actually yeah. had um 2500 views on our on our last upload wait that's amazing do you know where most of your viewers listeners are coming from i have a lot of questions for you guys but i feel like <laughs> we don't have a lot of answers <laughs> that, that's the truth <laughs> anyway jb where could they find us folks thank you so much for joining us 100 episodes thanks for sticking it out for the old timers and for the new people welcome we hope to see you again and continue to reverse course through discourse with us. Um, subscribe at Retraction Media, uh, share and comment, like on YouTube at Retraction Media again on Twitter. Follow us there. We're really engaged. And if you just want to catch us on the go or listen to the audio version, we're on Apple, Spotify, Spotify Google, Amazon, Audible, and more. Just check us out. Uh, this particularly was YouTube. Like it was self generated. Oh, okay. Cool. And with that, I was thinking of a suppository, not a prophylactic. Yeah, this sounds <laughs> set the record straight. Yeah. I knew there was another word. That's word. nothing alike. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Listen, it's been a long time since I felt instantly dumb. Like <laughs> instantly, like, oh my God. Um, and like how you, many times have you used prophylactically? Like, just like, <laughs> like at work. Uh, and can you imagine? I was hoping oh. that I was right, but I guess I'm wrong. No, <laughs> it's okay. There are both very fancy words for things that you could easily say very plainly, but That's if you choose true. to be fancy, <laughs> depository, prophylactic, I'm going to continue with prophylactics go up your butt, and I'm going to see where that leads <laughs> us. Retraction out.